Hi, Dr. Jaya Sridhar. So, Dr. Jaya Sridhar is the senior media advisor at Internews, and you're a doctor turned journalist, and you have published an online work about Let's Talk Vaccines, and that's had some incredible uptake. So, Dr. Jaya, if you could tell us one, what has been your key insight from that online module, and what has been the response like? Sure. So, um, a few words about the Let's Talk Vaccines course. So, it was a team of us that pulled it together, which was essentially the uh, health team at Internews. Um, Internews is an international media development organization. We work in about 100 countries around the world, promoting the uh, development of independent media. So uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic came along um, and vaccines eventually arrived on the scene, uh, you know, the, the information around vaccines followed pretty much the same pattern of dis and misinformation that the COVID-19 pandemic had uh, already generated. So we entered the environment which was already deluged by an infodemic around COVID-19. So it seemed sensible to offer support to journalists to sort of cut through uh, the mis and disinformation and the um, ambiguous messages around vaccines and come up with something simple that they could access online from their own homes. So with uh, along with my uh, three other course authors and the course director, uh, we pulled together this course and it, it's a very simple course for journalists, self-directed You can, and it's completely free of charge. And what it does is it gives you knowledge uh, through some very specific domains, the basic science of vaccines and then how they are manufactured and how they're distributed. And that brings in issues related to equitable distribution as well and what a journalist should track once the vaccines uh, come into the country and till they get into the arms of people, what a journalist should be tracking. Uh, uh, the uh, modules also look at human rights issues, as well as how journalists can report on a way that builds vaccine confidence, or at least e equips you with enough of information to understand what you're reading. So it's science media literacy is, mm. is like a running thread through the uh, course. And the uh, modules also offer information on how you can research your stories better uh, and offer some great examples of excellent reporting on vaccines that journalists around the world have uh, done and published. So we like to think of it as a very neat package for journalists that you can quickly get through. It's very practical and uh, packed with very useful tips and examples because we all learn from reading and uh, watching and listening to each other's work. So it's very much like a journalist to journalist, peer uh, led kind of uh, exchange of information and ideas. So the other really lovely thing about the course is that there's a space to collaborate. There's a space for community to uh, comment and ask questions uh, to the authors. And we're happy to sort of come online and respond to those questions. So there's a bit of hand-holding and uh, mentoring following this. So uh, the WHO um, in the EMBRO region, the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office, uh, actually got this project going for us. So it, the course has been translated into Arabic. The WHO has uh, been rolling it out in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean region. And it's also being translated into Spanish now and uh, uh, also into French, uh, which the Sabin Institute took up. The Sabin uh, Vaccine Institute mm -hmm. has got it translated into French so that it can reach uh, Francophone journalists as well. So we're excited about it, uh, primarily because it's by journalists for journalists. And I think we understand our needs far better. Ah, that's incredible. And it's interesting that you should speak about science literacy per se, because there's a kind of intimidation. People feel that you do not understand science. And how do you make it more palatable? And how do you make it more accessible? Is it really so difficult to understand how vaccinations work? Uh, it's, it, this is a really, uh, I think, uh, the central question, isn't it? Because um, I think it, we're at the start of a pretty long journey um, in terms of trying to build a scientific temper or science literacy among people. Uh, and I'm so glad that this is one of the uh, major outcomes for journalism uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. So if we, we've paid a heavy price for it in terms of millions of lives, because the media hasn't also been able to step up to the plate and do our jobs well. So I think that's enough of a motivation for us to realize our responsibilities. And I always, um, you know, when I, when I uh, teach and I talk to my students, I always say, uh, if you look at political reporters or someone following uh, the nuclear, um, you know, stories and so on, 
there's a lot of hard work and passion and dedication that goes into the story, right? You've been following the dramatis personae for years, what the nuclear doctrine of various countries have been, and uh, you know where was where were the face-offs and and what was the vote fast and how how is the situation shaping up now? And we have a clear perspective that's both historical and connected to global development. So it's very organic, the mm. relationship with that topic. And that hasn't really fully happened with science journalism. Uh, there are lots of passionate people out there who love to communicate science. And I think uh, it's great that we're seeing a lot of voices coming in. But building a scientific temper and scientific literacy among people means letting them into the secrets of how science really works. And I think a starting point is that science doesn't have all the answers. Science is the constant pursuit of answers. So this iterative process where science raises questions that are useful, relevant and can possibly save lives and how it goes about finding the answers, I think it's time to be transparent about that process. So um, I think it's um, a healthy irreverence for science mm. needs to come in, particularly for medicine, uh, so that the public learns to look at it critically and ask questions. And that's how I think we can really do it. But long journey, and we have to be, we have to be prepared to put in the homework, uh, you know, and learn about these things ourselves and how to communicate it, rather than just turning into a stenographer or a recordist when we're in front of a doctor or a, a science expert and then taking down what they say. Yeah, we need to be able to uh, be one step ahead of that game. It's so interesting you should say that because you are a doctor and. Uh, you would, people like to assume that doctors know it all. Yeah, I and wish. <laughs> <laughs> but from a, from a consumer, from a reader point of view, what do you do when you have so much conflicting health information? Do you think doctors need to be advocates of the right information? Oh, for sure. Um, they, uh, you might have seen the uh, results from the Edelman Trust Barometer hmm. this, this year. And it turns out that politicians and, and journalists have really slipped down to, I think, the two lowest yes. points on the trust scale globally. And uh, who, who do people tend to trust more? It's their employers, it's, it's business owners um, who, who are giving them their wages and their, their salaries, and followed by scientists and researchers. So I think the public is getting an inkling that they really need to turn to science and turn to people who are actually delivering on things in the front line, who are working in their laboratories or going out among the community and trying to create livelihoods and jobs for you that uh, you would rather trust, right? So I think in a sense that that's a good development and it's time for the journalists and the politicians to sort of catch up, hmm. right? By making sure that there's space provided, uh, that that highlights the work of uh, scientists. So it, it doesn't mean just giving them space in the media. It also means engaging with them and building relationships with them long term. So go visit their labs and find out what their day to day work is like mm. and how do they construct a piece of research? How do they design that? Uh, that's important for us to understand. And so I think it's a partnership that has to be built up where there's a greater exchange of information and um, to, to be fair to, uh, you know, scientists and, and, and doctors also, it's, it's like one of the reasons why there's a little bit of hesitation in, um, you know, reaching out to the media is the fear of being misquoted. Okay. And the media always wants a pat answer, you know, a certainty about everything. Correct. And you want a great headline to slap on top of that story. Whereas science is full of, uh, you know, the tentative quality, the tenuousness of the findings, that that sort of uh, range of a confidence interval or the uncertainty, uh, that's a difficult thing to capture. And it's a fabulous challenge for journalists. I mean, our words are our bread and butter. And if we can come up with this gorgeous, beautiful language to capture the uncertainty of science and all its beauty. Hmm. I mean, scientists are very certain about their uncertainty. Correct. And that needs to come out. Right. Yeah, I long like, journey, long journey. But I like the way you have articulated it. One of the interesting findings that I found uh, you speak about in a podcast was about how you think about literate people being more informed and that may not be the case. So in terms of vaccine hesitancy, you saw a lot of literate population in India that was hesitant. Yeah. How, do you, how do you make sense of that? Uh, 
Again, I think it's it's a process. We, we're in a, a sort of a, a flux, I think. Um, I think among in in states like Uttar Pradesh, for instance, there was a far uh, uh, speedier uptake mm. of the vaccine uh, of the COVID nineteen vaccine compared with uh, Tamil Nadu and Kerala, where the basic literacy rates among the population are much higher, as you know. So I think the fear or knowing a little bit doesn't really help you make a decision. So that brings us back to the uh, to the wonderful uh, opportunity for health journalists and the media in general and for large uh, platforms, uh, you know, uh, to to uh, sort of promote that kind of skill among health journalists to say, what are the conversations you need to construct? Like, how do you help people think through these issues? And I'm saying conversation because a two way exchange of ideas always layers understanding. And uh, when you're building science literacy and that's the way uh, things move forward, it's very difficult to sort of deliver a you know, a statement or and just say, believe me, hmm. uh, that's not what we want. We want to really help them think about it rather than being told what to think. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You seem to be doing such varied, fascinating work. What is it about work that gets you excited? What is it that you want to do? Um, I think science communication is um, uh, absolutely exciting because it comes with all the challenges that we sort of just that you beautifully captured in your questions. So, um, I think that um, if, if you if you look around us, I mean, we're in a context now where we're facing, a, uh, you know, um, the sixth mass extinction. We, we're hearing depressing news every day about uh, climate change and, and climate change is really hitting us on a, uh, you know, day to day basis where we're seeing uh, news um, on television, which is uh, I don't need to sort of remind you about it, but it's it's such a real and immediate thing. Right. And so how do you how do we interpret climate science for people? I mean, how do you make evidence based decisions about what to grow at home or whether you should dig a well or not? Mm -hmm. Or um, how do you know which crops to grow in the face of changing weather patterns? Uh, so I think that um, communicating science, understanding it, working with scientists and communicating it in a very timely fashion is going to have a direct and immediate uh, make a direct and immediate critical difference to the lives of people around us and that isn't that what journalism is all about so uh, very often the young journalists will say we, we came into journalism to make a difference and when now here's your chance so uh, I think science journalism increasingly and evidence-based discussions are uh, really where it's at not just for climate change but for all the other ramifications associated with health with zoonotic diseases mm -hmm. the next pandemic may be around the corner so I think we should stop medicalizing health a lot and really expand its scope to look at other sectors. Um, so you'll have a much broader canvas of stories to explore as well. But that, that means building expertise, hard work, yes. But unless that happens, we're not going to be able to produce quality commentary on many of these issues that affect the day-to-day -day lives of people. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Jaya. Your work gives us hope and inspiration and I hope we'll do. So does yours, so does yours. I mean, uh, I think there's, there's such scope to do great things. Yes, and I guess together we'll do better. Hope Thank so. you. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks.